is Off Script with Trish Close, intimate interviews and conversations with interesting people. And today in front of my microphone, Liz Juan, associate, or excuse me, assistant wine maker to Sarah Vineyards. Thank you, Trish, for having me today. Hi, now you don't sound like yourself this morning. No, no, I um, am overachieving in the sickness levels. Okay. Um, you kind of sound like you've smoked a pack of ciggies last night. Well, I wanted to come and be as sexy as you, and I figured <laughs> the sexy voice might help. <laughs> so what's going on with you? You've got, like, allergies. I've got a little upper respiratory infection crossed with a little walking pneumonia with <laughs> a little overlay of uh, bad allergies. You know, that No thing. big deal. No big deal. That thing. Nothing. All right, Miss Liz Wan, um, we're going to talk about Sarah a little bit later, but first of all, where are you from? I, that is a tricky question. So I am full-blooded Cantonese. Okay. And so my whole entire family traced back all through the lineages, all come from Canton, China. Okay. However, my father was a commercial photographer for Kodak, and so I was born on assignment in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Wow. So I claim both countries. So, like, what was your childhood like then? Oh, my childhood was amazing. You know, I think at the time I probably didn't think so, so much. But I've spent basically the time I was born to about the time I was about six, traveling all throughout China, uh, Mongolia, Southeast Asia, India, Tibet, etc. Wow. What were your um, What was your family like? What were your parents like? Um, at the time, we were a very small unit. It was my father, my mother, and myself. Um, my mother was a model. My father was a commercial photographer, and so he would often get sent out to photograph some of the most amazing things. Um, one of the ones that I remember the most vividly is uh, snow leopards, which are very rare. Um, and when he was in the cage taking the picture, his flash accidentally went off. And so the snow leopard literally clawed his knee. Oh. And he almost died because they gave him um, some drug that he was allergic to that sent him into anaphylactic shock. Wow. Yeah, so it was really crazy, but super awesome at the same time. I got to see lots of different things growing up. It sounds like it. Your mom was a model, like fashion model, like? Um, a lot of different styles of model, not so much fashion, but more um, on, on site uh, for specific shoots and okay. more a lot of landscape photography okay. and commercial photography. Okay. Very glamorous. She thought so. I mean, that the whole thing, though, your dad being this photographer and your mom being this model, just very, it sounds just very glamorous. You know, I think um, I didn't realize it at the time. Yeah. And my mother gave up a lot of that when she had me. Um, so, it, you know, now as an adult, I recognize how powerful um, that unit was between the two of them. Okay. And more specifically, how great so many of the sacrifices were that they made. Right, right. So, were you only child? Did you have siblings? Only child until we came to the United States. Okay. So, uh, why we came was because my father really wanted to make sure that his daughter had the opportunity to get an education. Wow. Which in Asia is not really a thing. Right. Um, and so they moved to the United States. My father gave up his career. My mother gave up her career when she had me. Mm -hmm. um, and then we uh, were blessed with my little sister. Awesome. So going back to your parents really quickly, where's your dad and your mom from originally? Both from Canton, China. Oh, okay. Okay. So, but they traveled all, all, all the time. Over. Okay. Mainly because of my father's job. Exactly. Exactly. So when did you come to the U.S.? When I was about eight years old. Wow. So young. Yes. Very young. Um, so English is actually my sixth, fifth, fifth or sixth language. I was going to ask. Um, I grew up speaking Cantonese first. Um, and then my mother was from a hill village called Hokkien. So I learned Hokkien and Mandarin almost simultaneously because those were the two languages she spoke. Right. Um, and then when I was around uh, four to six-ish, you know, we spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia, hmm. um, specifically Thailand and Malaysia. Uh, my father did a lot of work for the prime ministers there. Um, and so I learned to speak a little Thai and a little Malay through uh, that childhood wow. time frame. Have you guys been back? Have you been back? Yes. Um, actually, my, my parents were, were big sticklers. Um, you know, it's always hard for people to come from one culture yes. and um, marry their family into a new culture. And they felt it was very important that I never lose my, my roots, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and so growing up, uh, you know, we visited as often as we could. Um, and we have a lot of extensive family all throughout China and Southeast Asia still. Okay, so it was important for them, you know, you because especially you moved to the U.S. at such a young age, they didn't want you sort of to forget about where you came from. That was their biggest fear. Really? Their biggest fear. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And in some ways it really worked against them. Yeah. <laughs> for what that's worth. Really? Oh, absolutely. I feel like 100% I'm a giant weirdo because of that. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean... 
you know, you come from this, from one culture, you are mm -hmm. thrown into another. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I grew up in Ukiah, California. I think we, there was like six Asian people in the entire city. Okay. Um, my family being four of them. Um, and so I very much learned to assimilate. Um, did you, did you ever feel like that where do I belong kind of thing? Or was that ever an issue for you? I don't know that I did, to be honest. You okay. know, I, I was really lucky in some ways. Um, I guess there was a very short period of time when we first moved to the United States and I was just starting to, to you know, get uh, used to the school system here. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, children can be uh, not always conscious of how... Mean. Yes. That's the word we're looking for. Yep. Kids are mean. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so I was kind of taken under the wing of uh, five boys that decided that, you know, that wasn't cool. And I kind of grew up with them. So I kind of had a new family, so to speak, um, in these five guys that really, for all intents and purposes, raised me up, which I like to uh, often say that it is not my parents' fault the way I turned out. It's theirs. It's theirs. It's those boys. Yep, those boys. So boys like middle school, high school? From elementary school okay. on, we kind of potted together and never really split up. So... Yeah. So did you kind of grow up then like a tomboy a little bit because you were hanging out with all these dudes? A hundred percent. I remember my first grade year, my mother scrimped and pinched and saved every cent and bought me this lovely lace dress to wear on the first day of school. And after school, I used it for third base. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. So, but those boys, um, do you, are you still in touch with them? Oh, 100%. They're that's, amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, I've married them all off, uh, a couple of them a couple times, so. <laughs> Perfect. What were you like in high school? You know, I, I think I've always just been a giant weirdo, you know what I mean? So it wasn't any different in high school. Um, I was definitely, my, it was important to my family that grades were always sure. top notch and um, very involved in the community, played sports, mm -hmm. um, graduated early. Um, because I really wanted to explore the world and you know after so many AP classes they just don't know what to do with you. So. For sure, <laughs> for sure. So I think there is a stereotype out there that you know Asian children especially coming from you know Asia to the United States and growing up in in America more reserved and you know they're in violin classes and ballet classes and they're you know good at chess. I don't know it's just a horrible stereotype and not as outgoing or bubbly as a one Liz Juan? Uh, again, I, I'll blame all five of those boys. Okay. Um, uh, my mother was absolutely your stereotypical tiger mother. Um, I think I grew up the first decade and a half of my life with a lot of her voices in my head Okay. Um, about who and what I should be. And okay. uh, I met those five boys and really clearly decided that that was not who I was ever going to be. Did they pull you out? Sort of? Not so much pulled me out, but they gave me an option as to who else I could be. Interesting. Um, and it felt so right that I never really looked back. Did your parents like these guys? They they did in a way because Except they them? knew that I was safe with them. That's um, amazing. And that there was power in numbers. Um, and they recognized our bond pretty much right off the bat. Of course, they weren't excited about the fact that there was little hope that I was going to really focus on my Asian studies, my <laughs> piano lessons and my ballet lessons, um, you know, and it wasn't until I was about 12 that I was finally able to completely break free of my yeah. mother and just be like, mm-mm, yeah. that's just not happening, Mom. Did you take ballet lessons and piano lessons? Oh, yeah. Big time. All of the above. Yeah. I played violin. I'm really good at chess. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, mathematics, I, I am that Asian. I, I like to say that I'm really good at arithmetic, but uh -huh. mathematics, not so much. Okay. So I'm halfway right. Asian on that. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 <laughs> good job. Good job. <laughs> you know, one can but try. <laughs> checking, off, checking off those boxes. <laughs> exactly. So what then came after high school? You said you graduated early. Did you, was, was college in your future? Did you want to travel? Yep. I, I really wanted to do all the things, um, you know, and that was, you know, when I was an early teenager, I started I was a voracious reader, and I read everything um, by everyone. And I would—I was one of those people like I'd pick an author and then just rip through their entire like bibliography of everything they ever wrote. Um, and so, in so doing, I discovered that there was this whole world I hadn't yet even discovered: hmm. South America, Europe. You know, I really at that point had felt like I'd seen the world doing so much travel. I mean, I think I'd been through my first two passports before I was even a teenager. That's amazing. Um, so to then realize that there was even more out there, I absolutely wanted all of that. 
Um, and when we moved to Ukiah, California, my um, family was assigned um, an English uh, as a second language um, instructor. Um, and this wonderful woman by the name of Marjorie Burr actually taught my parents to speak English, took me under her wing, um, ended up adopting us as her family, so adopted me as her granddaughter and my sister as her granddaughter. Um, and she was amazing. Um, and one of the things that she always wanted for me was a really good education and to get out of Ukiah. Mm -hmm. And she had graduated from Cornell, um, spent some time at Yale University, and uh, so it was always my dream to go. And so I graduated early and went to Yale, um, studied psychology there, um, and that opened up another whole world of not just the world as places, but the world as people. Um, and that just set me on my life uh, journey, for sure. So Yale, that's mm -hmm. pretty impressive. I mean, it is and it isn't. I mean, I do believe that there's something to be said for coming from Ukiah and um, having this ability to really focus in an area that is very rural at the time, wasn't a lot going on. Um, and then, of course, you know, having the legacy background of her as my adopted grandmother definitely probably helped. Um, and then my SAT scores didn't hurt. Um, right. At the time, I didn't have text anxiety. Ironically, as an adult, I have horrible test anxiety. So, yeah. you know, weird how these things work. <laughs> well, I think, but Yale is one of those in a handful of schools that uh, this, you know, country kind of puts up here on a pedestal a little bit. So I think when we hear someone, oh, I, I went to Yale, it's kind of like, ew. No. It's one of the reasons I rarely talk about it, is mm -hmm. I find that it there is a there is a stigma, there is a judgment, there is a, a level of, oh, you're one of those. You right. know what I mean? Right. Um, and I never really understood that until um, I got to the university and realized there was this huge rivalry between, of course, Yale and Harvard. Yeah. And I do that now to, to people who tell me that they graduated from Harvard. I'm like, oh. Huzzah. You're one of those. You're one of those. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they're not. They're wonderful human being just, beings just like anybody else. Right. But there are those stigmas. And I, I never like to be branded. Mm -hmm. That's just not who I am. There's so many. I'm an onion. You know what I mean? They just peel away those layers. So many layers. So many layers. Very, very <laughs> Shrek-like right now. Yes. So when did you finish Yale? Oh, gosh. 96? technically 97 properly. Okay. So I was one of those, uh, you know, I, I could have walked either year kind of thing. Okay. What did you do after Yale? Um, I came back home. So my father passed uh, my junior year um, at a uh, university. And it was very much like, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Runaway Bride. Yes. Where she just, she talks in that scene about how she didn't know how to have her eggs cooked because she'd always had them the same way her husband had. Right, right. Um, and, you know, in my culture, women are raised to live for your father until he passes, your husband until he passes, and your yeah. son until they pass. Right. Um, and my mother, having lost her husband and her father and having no sons, lost herself for a moment there. Hmm. Um, and I recognize that when my sister, uh, I had always requested my sister's transcripts from school to be sent directly to me at the university, and she got her first B. And like, to be clear, like, I am the dumber sister. <laughs> so when I saw that B, I was like, ooh, there's a problem. <laughs> there's a big problem. Um, and so I wrapped things up pretty hastily uh, at university and came home um, and helped my mother through the transition and uh, eventually moved my sister and my mother to Southern California with me. Um, where I had done some research and recognized that it was the top 10 school systems in the nation mm -hmm. um, and recognized that my sister needed that challenge and needed a little bit more structure in her life. Mm -hmm. um, and we got my mother back on her feet, moved her to San Francisco where she had a great support system of family and friends, more friends than family, um, and then uh, took over custody of my sister at that point. Really? Yep, from the time she was eight to the, about the time she was 18, um, I, I had custody of my sister. Okay, so raised her, essentially. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. And this year she's getting married, so That's I'm amazing. so excited. That's so amazing. Excited. So it sounds like you guys are incredibly close. We are, um, in some ways, and I mean, right now, I mean, she works for Apple, she travels the world, so I don't get as much time with her as I'd like. Um, but we do stay in touch, and we are connected on a level that will never be broken um, because of our childhood and our family. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, you know, melding two cultures is never easy on parents or the children. And so you always have that in common. Why did you feel the need to 
mm-hmm. kind of take that move with your sister as far as custody goes? I really felt like my my sister needed a firm, a firm regime, if you will. Mm-hmm. And my mother at the time was too emotionally vulnerable mm-hmm. to get her there. Um, and I also felt like my mother, who had spent her entire life giving to all of us, needed some time to find out what was going to make her happy. Needed a break. Uh, needed a break and needed some time to explore, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And mm-hmm. to, to not have responsibilities and to do what her heart told her to do. Kind of like a second life home. maybe for her? Exactly, you know what I mean? I feel like um, you know when all of that happened, it became clear to me um, that she really, her identity was all of us. And that's what she lived for and that's great. But at that point in time in her life, I felt like she had so much more potential to give mm-hmm. that we were holding her back. Um, and this was a wonderful way to, to make everybody live to their full potential. That's a sacrifice, Liz Juan. It, it didn't seem like it at the time. It just seemed like the right decision, I'll be honest. Um, but looking back, I definitely recognized that there was a lot that I did give up and my, a lot that my mother gave up. I mean, mm-hmm. when you think about what she went through to come to a place that she could leave her youngest with her oldest, you know? I mean, that's hard on a parent. A sacrifice on her part too. A huge Mm -hmm. sacrifice and a huge amount of faith in me to be able to say, you've got this Mm -hmm. and I can go do my thing and not have guilt about it. Mm -hmm. Um, And not to say that she doesn't have guilt about it, but at the time it was, you know, being able to have that comfort level to walk away. Sure, sure. So what made you, take the wine route then? Because that's that's clearly your passion right now. Um, that is your love. What made you, what what happened or why did you decide to, I'm going to, I'm going to make wine. I want to make wine. Yeah. You know, it's funny because, uh, you know, the, the transition from my mother to who I am today, you know, she was an incredible woman. And, you know, one of the things she always said was, is that it was always going to be my mouth that got me into trouble. <laughs> And it's amazing to me today, sitting here with you, how true that was in so many ways. And, you know, I don't know there was ever a decision. It was very organic. Um, You know, I grew up in restaurants um, in Ukiah. My parents had um, a cafe and they had a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Um, And at a very young age, uh, I did a lot of translating. My parents were not that great in English. Um, I think, you know, it's one of those things when you're a, a kid, you pick up languages so easily. Um, and the older you get, the harder that becomes. Um, and so I was able to pick up the language and uh, able to really help out a lot with the businesses. And one of the places my parents really never understood was alcohol. So mm-hmm. at a very young age, I was doing all of the beer ordering, all of the wine ordering for our businesses. Um, and so I gained that knowledge very young. You know, I also grew up with the Parducci families and the Fetzer families and, you know, had those boys and girls in my classes. And so, you know, when harvest came, just like it is here in Southern Oregon, it's all hands on deck and, you know, everybody comes together to bring that fruit in. And so getting to see that and to see the family that comes with that and the family that doesn't just focus on bloodlines, but the family that comes together to create this art form was instilled in me at a very young age. And of course, I didn't process any of that until I started working in restaurants at a higher level and it was fine dining and then Mm -hmm. it was star dining and then it was private dining. And the more I did, the more I learned, the more I wanted to know, the more I researched. Um, And at one point in time, I had a wine rep uh, look at me in my dining room and say, Liz, you know more than most of the sommeliers in the area. Um, I was in Orange County at the time and that was a time frame when everybody wanted a psalm. Mm-hmm. And uh, my regional manager for the entire Southwest region happened to be sitting at the table behind me when this guy said that. Interesting. And uh, so the wine rep walked away, and uh, I'll never forget, Jim McTagg uh, stood up and said, you know, we've got a great educational program, and we will pay for anything you want to do. And if you think you can do this, it would bring great things to our program. And so I was like, shoot, why not? Wow. Nothing to lose, right? That's sort of like a path that was meant to be. Like, oh, it was in my lap. Here you yeah. go, you know. And so I self-studied level one, um, and not to date myself, but back then, the Court of Masters only had three levels. They've now separated that first level into uh, intro and level one because that first level was had such a high fail rate um, that they felt they had to do something. Mm-hmm. Um, And so at the time, it was just the three levels. I self-studied level one and uh, 
passed through whatever measures I can still not fathom. <laughs> and uh, then they encouraged me to do uh, the advanced and I passed that. Um, and it was about that time that I went to go work for one of my heroes, Randall Graham at Bonnie Dune. Okay. Oh, nice. And um, well, what happened from there? So Randall Graham is this incredible iconoclast who was one of the first people who felt like Roan varieties would do well in California. And uh, really just, he's always about Vonda efforts and Vin de terroir, you know, and all about not making cookie cutter wines. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time he was exploring the world and bringing these amazing varieties like Herba de Luce and Ruque and these unknown, largely um, arcane varieties from all over the world to the United States and teaching these American palates that Yes, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot and Chardonnay are wonderful, but look at the rest of this stuff. Right, right. And I just wanted to follow his path to the end of the earth, you know what I mean? And um, again, it was one of those really weird things. Um, a really good girlfriend of mine, Christina, uh, was a wine rep uh, for Wine Warehouse at the time. Bonnie Dune was one of the wine brands that they represented, and she um, had the... Uh, VP of sales in her car, and they were visiting accounts in the California market. No way. And David Amadia, I'll never forget his name, uh, looked at her and was like, you know, we're really looking for someone in Southern in Southern California uh -huh. uh, to manage the key accounts. Um, and this person's gotta be all of these things. And, and she tells me the story all the time. She was like, I went home, I was in the shower, you know, he had asked me to make some recommendations and to mm -hmm. throw some names mm -hmm. his way. And I really couldn't think of anything, you know, based off of like, because this was going to be high profile, a lot of travel, yeah. someone who could walk into any account and get along with somebody and could speak the language, but not be too snooty or too dorky. <laughs> and all of a sudden, as I'm shampooing my hair, your name popped into my brain and it was perfect. So she literally got out of the shower, called David Amadea back, gave him my name and my number, and that's the how the rest, rest of that is, happened. rest is history. What brought you to Oregon? A boy. <laughs> oh, it's always a boy. Oh, and even better, it was her boy. <laughs> <laughs> Scandalous. Oh, I love it. I Scandalous. love it. It's so bizarre. So a boy brought you to Oregon. Yes. So You followed a boy to Oregon. Oh, even better than that. So Christina had an old Bronco that she told me was a late 60s convertible that she didn't want to get parking tickets for anymore. She wasn't driving it. And so she wanted to give it away. And when I was raising my sister, one of the things I did to make a little money on the side to help pay for how expensive children are mm -hmm. is I would find beat up cars, I would fix them, and I would resell them for a quick turn on cash. And so in my mind, she's giving me a amazing, classic convertible Bronco. Yes. And I was all about it. For sure, I would be too. Yes. So she made the arrangements, and immediately the day I went to go pick this Bronco up, I realized I had been set up in a big way. So I walk in, lights are down, all these candles are lit, the biggest just smear of sushi you've ever seen <laughs> in your entire life. And in walks Robert Van Wyck with his beautiful blue eyes, that pink slip, those keys, and a Chilton with all the notes in the margins to hand off the car. And uh, that was the end of that story. Okay. Um, and his mother lives up here. Okay. Uh, beautiful woman. She's uh, 89 years old this November. Wow. Uh, she bowls three days a week, volunteers at the hospital one day a week. I love it. And so about a decade ago when uh, his father passed, um, his mother's Dutch. You can always tell a Dutch woman. You just can't tell him much. <laughs> she had buried her husband in that house. She wasn't moving anywhere, didn't care that mm -hmm. the rest of us were in SoCal. And so Robert had a conversation with her one day and, and was pretty clear that she needed a little bit of support. She had a lot of friends in the area. Sure. But there's a difference between friends and, and family. family. Mm -hmm. And so he looked at me and he's like, I feel like I need to move up there. Um, and the, both of us were just really... Neither of us were really the SoCal type. Mm -hmm. We were definitely ready to get out of the area. And this was Southern Oregon he was moving back to. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yeah, and we were both in Huntington Beach at the time. 
Okay, well, that's a switch from a Hunt- little bit. Huntington Beach. You know, Chuck is from Huntington Beach. Uh huh. Okay, you yeah, guys have had that I conversation. Love him so much. Yes. <laughs> we like know all the same haunts. We speak the same language. <laughs> he gets me on an internal level. <laughs> yes, yes. So you move up here to Southern Oregon. What year is that? Oh, God, I have no idea. Okay. You have to ask Robert, but I want... Some, a long time ago. I want to say 2007 is my Oh, guess. that's not a long time ago. Yeah, it was about a decade ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so... Um, you, Horrible at dates. <laughs> it, it's all right. It's it, I am the same way. So you started working then at wineries when you moved up here, or... I didn't, when actually. Did, when did that happen? So I came up here, and really, I thought I was giving up my career. So I gave my oh. notice at Bonnie Dune. I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to move up here and do. But the beautiful thing about being in food and beverage your entire life is is that you can pretty much move anywhere and not ever have to worry about getting a job or paying the bills. <laughs> you know, there's there's restaurants everywhere you go. Everywhere. And if you're good at what you do, you've always got a job. That's Yes, you're and right. And so I was like, whatever, let's go. Let's do this, you know. And um, so the first trip we came up here, more kind of an R&D trip, get a lay of the land uh-huh. kind of thing. Um, we brought a few things up just to kind of self-move in type of thing. Um, we actually drove to 38 and took the long route from Jacksonville to Grants Pass where she lives and where okay. we were moving. And whereas I thought I was giving up my career, I start looking around and it's like vineyard, tasting room, vineyard, tasting room, yeah. vineyard, tasting room. And I'm like, wait a minute. And that was the time in Southern Oregon where it was sort of starting to simmer. We were oh, simmering on the wine totally. scene. Totally. So 2002, of course, was when... Um, uh, Troon Vineyard got that high accolade for best zin in the world. Yeah. Um, Valley View was doing amazing things and starting to really uh, cascade through the nation along with uh, Del Rio at the time. Um, and of course, all of uh, all of Oregon was really starting to get mm-hmm. a lot of amazing write-ups mm-hmm. and take a lot of amazing accolades from some pretty big names like Stephen Spurrier, Robert Parker, and so on and so forth. So you were like, hmm. Exactly. I didn't realize it, I'll be honest, until I got here. It was probably a year and a half here uh, before I started to realize what we had. Okay. Um, and more importantly, it broke me out of this mold of high end and first growth and cult wines Mm -hmm. and things that nobody could get or collectors. And it really immersed me into artisan products, um, artisan productions, a great to glass in a way that I'd never seen before. Okay. Um, and, And I started to realize the vast amounts of varieties that were grown here. And I started to realize the microclimates that allowed for mm-hmm. those varieties and the soil types and how Mother Nature essentially built this valley to grow grapes in. Yeah. Through the mountain ranges and the tectonic shifts and the soil deposits everywhere mm-hmm. and the crazy elevations and the mountain ranges that largely give us the climate that we have here that's so different from the rest of the state. Yeah, you are geeking out right now so on, sorry. A level, My on, bad. A, on a level that I've, I haven't seen before. My though. bad. I can go into like the philosophy of how Mother Nature created <laughs> Southern Oregon just for the grape industry um, and winemakers alike. Um, um, it's pretty funny. So you have to stop me from time to time. I, you work at Sarah. <laughs> well, you work at Sarah now, but did you work? At, did you work at a winery before Sarah? I did. So actually, my career path um, in Southern Oregon is a really interesting one. Um, many families uh, have raised me to the creature <laughs> that I am today. Um, so I started at thinking I was coming from. I had a private club background. I felt like private clubs was something I knew. So I started actually at the Rogue Valley Country Club okay. as their first sommelier when I came up to Southern Oregon. Awesome. Um, and helped create uh, and establish uh, a, a wine program that has been built upon by so many others today and is amazing. Um, and then I worked at Club Northwest for a while. Okay. Um, that was a, a phase that I went through where I just really wanted to fish my brains out every weekend. Okay. Um, and needed a nine to five job. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was through that job at Club Northwest where I was um, their marketing coordinator, um, where uh, the Drapers sent me out to Troon Vineyard, um, and they sent me out there to you know sell them an ad for the the Club Northwest. Uh, they have these amazing screens that talk about all the local delights. Mm-hmm. And uh, I met uh, her, uh, Chris Martin, first of all. Right. And uh, we were talking about my background at Bonnie Dune, and he's like, well, you might know Herb Gwaii, because Herb used to work at Bonnie Dune, so that was super weird. And so we walk into the cellar, and Herb and I are geeking out. Because Herb was the winemaker at the time at Troon. Uh, he was the winemaker at the time at Troon, yep. And, of course, he was an uh, assistant winemaker or an associate winemaker, I'm not sure which, at Bonnie Dune for many, many years. Okay. Um, and v- worked very closely with Randall. 
Um, so, you know, we geeked out on Randall sure. and John Locke and all of our past friends and all that kind of stuff. And it felt so comfortable. And mm -hmm. so after that little exchange, you know, Chris walked me back into the office and he's like, this is your office now. And, you know, you're going to need to tell the Drapers what happened today. And, you know, I know them well, so let me know if I need to say any words. And I'm looking at him like, this guy's crazy, right? right. Like, I've got a job. I need to fish my brains out every weekend. Like, you don't know me. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. And, you know, the rest of it was really um, kismet in the way it all just kind yeah. of fell together. Um, there was a lovely, amazing woman by the name of Allison Pazurek, who was a perfect fit for my position at Club Northwest, which freed me up to Beautiful. be there for true. And it just worked out. It was gorgeous. Wait. Everything in my life tends to fall that. It fall sounds into my like it. Yeah. It sounds like it. Very organic. Um, and I, well, I always believe everything happens for a reason. So just sort of don't worry about major decisions because I just feel like it'll just happen the way it's supposed to happen. I know that's probably stupid, but no. In my life, everything that I've ever fought, like pounded my head up against brick mm -hmm. walls for, I found out in the end that either one they weren't going to happen the way yeah. I wanted them to. Or B, it wasn't something I wanted in the end. Exactly. Um, yet all of the things that organically happen for me always bring me to amazing places. So mm -hmm. I've really learned in my life to just ride let, the wave. Yeah, let it go. Just let just it go. Just drop in, hang ten. Uh, so when did you start working at Sarah? I started working at Sarah. Whew, gosh, now let's see here. I want to say this is my sixth year at Sarah Vance. Wow, Okay. Um, so I had, after leaving Troon, there, I came to a place where I really felt like Southern Oregon was amazing. And one of the challenges in Southern Oregon is, is that 80% of our producers are 5,000 cases or less. Um, and in so doing, I recognized that in each of these organizations, each organization had a lot of core competencies. But where they maybe didn't have that area of expertise, they didn't have the wherewithal financially to be able to hire somebody necessarily full-time or part-time for the team to be able to accomplish those things. So I started a company by the name of Venoverse Consulting. Mm -hmm. And Venoverse was literally built to help anyone and everyone I could to elevate the awareness and the appreciation of Southern Oregon, the wines we produce and the people that live in it, mm -hmm. um, and to also help some of my other colleagues outside of the area that maybe needed a little bit of assistance on a project here or there. Okay. Um, and through Venoverse, uh, Krista and Scott found me, and uh, at first I came on as a consultant. They had just purchased this amazing property by the name of Applegate Red mm -hmm. from an amazing human being by the name of Paul Ferreria, yeah. Hawaiian Portuguese guy that was crazy in all the best ways, <laughs> made amazing wines um, despite all of his challenges and obstacles. Um, and they were very uh, focused on making sure that they paid homage to the legacy that came before them mm -hmm. on that property before establishing and, and creating and celebrating a new brand. And Scott's Portuguese. so Scott's Portuguese. It exactly was right. match made in heaven there. It was. Um, and it's so fun because uh, Frank's family still visits the area Aww, often. Nice. Um, we've pretty much adopted them. I mean, Scott and Chris have pretty much adopt everybody. Like that's, yeah. We joke all the time that Chris is not our CEO. She's our CEM, our chief executive mom, mm -hmm. because they don't hire employees. They adopt adults <laughs> um, and wine club members and other families right. and whatever. Um, and so they uh, really kind of found me through Cara and Greg Olmo, actually, of Wooldridge Creek, because they were up there talking with Cara and Greg, and mm -hmm. they were um, talking about how they needed this person to kind of celebrate the past before building the future, and they were like, you should talk to Liz. You know, she might be a good fit. She knows a lot about the area. She's, you know, she's an applicator yeah. kind of thing. And um, the more we did together, the more we just recognized that all of our philosophies were very mirrored. Um, what they wanted for Southern Oregon, I wanted for Southern Oregon. How they saw the pathway of getting Southern Oregon to where it needed to be was the same pathway I saw, which was a rising tide raises all berries. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, you know, the more <laughs> of uh, the community you support, you know, the, the more that's going to happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, God, we could talk about wine all day because you are, you, you call yourself, and you are studying to to become more than just a sommelier. Yes. Um, so I uh, recently, after my studies at the Court of Masters, I very much recognized that um, there was a whole other world of studies to be had as well. Right. Um, so I went through the Wine Society Educational Trust um, and achieved my WSET Level 3. Uh, and then from there went into the diploma program and recently was um, accepted as a candidate to the Masters of Wine program. 
Wow. So yes. you, you're working to become a master of wine. I am. Now, granted, worst case scenario for all of us that are in that boat yeah. um, is that we need to recognize that we can spend up to a decade and up to a quarter million dollars right. and still fail 90% of us. Right. So at that point in time, you know, you have to recognize you may never get the title, but the path is going to teach you things mm -hmm. and to uh, broaden your horizons in a way that you could never even imagine. Yeah. You're just riding the wave right now. Drop it in, hang okay. 10. I like it. Uh, we are wrapping up, so I'm gonna get to my final three. Uh, best advice you've ever been given? Establish and define your village and always be there when they need you. Okay, where, where did that advice come from? It was actually um, a woman that I lived with uh, for a while. Her name was Diane Ray, and she had um, degenerative arthritis, um, and she was an amazing spirit that taught me so much about life. And in her world, every human being had a village, um, that it takes a village to raise any one of us. Mm -hmm. And it's that village that's going to not only define who you are, but that's going to help you get to everywhere you want to be. And so her philosophy in life was very simple. You figure out who your village is, and whenever they call, like one Trish Glose, you come running. Yes, I like this lady. Um, that's very true with you, just looking from your parents to your sister to those five boys that you met in elementary school to the jobs that you've worked at. You really take on this sense of family and that this group has taken you under their wing or you've taken this person under your wing or you've sort of been adopted at, at Sarah. I mean, you really, that's a really big thing for you. It is. I mean, I feel like in life, you know, you're, you're there's family that you're born with mm -hmm. and then there's family that you've been given and you can choose to keep them or you can choose to not keep them. But what they've given you is, is, a, is a debt that you must pay back. Um, and how you pay that back, oftentimes life will define for you. Okay, all right. Um, if you ever moved from this place, the Rogue Valley, Southern Oregon, what would you miss the most? What would bring you back here? Honestly, it's the people. You know, when I talk about community and I talk about giving back and I talk about that village, there is an intimacy, there is a level of hospitality and there's a level of love and celebration that happens in Southern Oregon mm -hmm. that is so simple and so pure that there are few places in the world anymore that you can live in, that you can resonate that everywhere you look. True. And that's what I would miss about Southern Oregon. It's a very, very popular answer in this podcast that I found, uh, the people. A lot of people would miss the people here. My final and favorite question, if you were given a last meal and a last drink, what would it be? Mm, it would probably be an amazing tomahawk steak a giant platter of sushi, fresh house-made carbonara, and a Barolo aged about a decade. You're not messing around. That's quite the meal. <laughs> Here's the thing. Would it all be consumed or until In you... courses. Of course. Absolutely. Oh, courses. Courses, okay. yes, absolutely. Champagne to start, Barolo in the middle, single malt scotch at the end. <laughs> This is why I love you, Liz Juan. <laughs> this is why I love you. If you're listening to this podcast on iTunes and you like it, please subscribe, rate, and review. It helps other people find us. And you can check out the video portion of this podcast at ktbl.com. Just go to features and then off script. Liz Juan, sexy, raspy voice and all. Thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. My pleasure. Come back so we can talk about wine stuff. Anytime you call.